All right. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing today? <laughs> good. Glad to hear it. So uh, in case you don't know me, my name is David, and I am the, uh, the small groups director here at Severn. And uh, today I get the honor and the privilege of, of actually being up here to teach. And a uh, fun fact for you guys, uh, today is actually the last time that I'll be up here as a man in my 20s. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, uh, so coming, this coming Thursday, I'll be leaving my youth behind forever and turning 30. So, uh, <laughs> but enough about me. So we are in the midst of our series called Resilient out of the book of Philippians. And uh, today we're going to be right at the beginning of chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 1 through 3. So it's not a real long uh, passage, but I'm going to go ahead and read that. Uh, and then we'll get started here. So chapter 3, it says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write to you again about this is no trouble for me and is a protection for you. Watch out for dogs, watch out for evil workers, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. So right at the beginning of this passage, we see the, we see the statement, rejoice in the Lord. And what's interesting about that is that that is a command. And that's interesting because so often we see joy as something that is, you know, based on our circumstance. You know, if good things happen to me, I have joy. But if bad things happen to me, I don't have joy. Uh, but what we're looking at today, the passage we're looking at today, what it shows us is what to watch out for and what to hold on to or what to remember in order to have joy regardless of what life throws our way, regardless of the circumstances that we face. So right away after telling us to rejoice, uh, Paul jumps in in, uh, in verse 2 and he tells us to watch out. And he says, watch out for dogs, watch out for evil workers, and watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. So that obviously brings a couple of questions to mind, like who are these people and why is Paul using such harsh language towards them? And, uh, and why is it so important that we watch out for them? And uh, these three descriptors, they're actually just talking about uh, one group of people. It's talking about a group of people that were known as the Judaizers at the time. And the Judaizers were a group of Jews who would travel around to towns after they heard the good news of Jesus, and they would begin spreading false ideas and begin basically undercutting the gospel or undercutting the message of Jesus. And it was those false ideas that had Paul so fired up, that had him using the, these, uh, these harsh terms towards them, because he knew that these ideas were in direct opposition. They were in direct opposition to the one place where we truly can find joy regardless of our circumstances. They were in direct opposition to a relationship with Jesus. Because what the gospel is, the gospel is that because of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection, by, by grace through faith in Jesus alone, we can be saved. So it's just solely what Jesus has done, not what we've done. But what the Judaizers' message was, they were coming in and they were saying, well, actually, you need to follow these Jewish laws, these Jewish customs or rituals, things like circumcision. You need to do these things in addition to what Jesus has done. And, you know, to us that might sound, you know, inconvenient or maybe annoying, but, you know, still might not raise the alarm bells. Is, you know, why is Paul so angry? Why is that such a big deal? And the reason that that is such a big deal is because when you add anything to the message of the gospel, you completely change the message of the gospel. Because in essence, what these Judaizers were saying, they were saying, hey, what Jesus did for you, that wasn't enough. You need to do these things. You need to do more in order to earn God's favor or in order to have right standing before God. And there's no quicker way to rob your life of joy than to try to live that way. Because basically we'll end up in one of two camps. You know, and you'll probably swing between the two throughout your life if you're trying to live that way. Because when you're doing really well, at the good deeds that you think will make God like you or, or will earn you favor from God. When you're doing well, whether you realize it or not, you'll become very prideful, very arrogant, and really prone to judging other people. And uh, if we're being honest, you become a pretty unbearable person to be around. <laughs> but whenever you fail or when you're not living up to the, the standard that you think is set or you're not, you know, you're just not achieving what you are performing the way you think you need to perform for God to, to like you, then you're going to become very discouraged and very depressed and probably riddled with anxiety as you begin to realize you're just not good enough. And if you've attached your self-worth to your performance, you might even begin to believe the lie that you don't have worth. And this actually brings us up to our first main idea today. We have two main ideas. And the first one is that joy is found in relationship, not religion. So this idea that we need to work our way to God or we need to work to justify ourselves, this wasn't unique to that time period and it definitely wasn't unique to just the Judaizers. Um, that idea that we need to work our way to God is the central message of religion or works-based religion. Always has been, still is today. 
Because religion will tell you, you know, the list of rules will change, but they'll say, follow these rules, and hopefully at the end of your life, you know, your good will outweigh your bad, and God will let you into paradise. Or you'll reincarnate at the next level, or you'll become one with the universe. You know, the, the terminology will change, but the message of religion is the same across the board. But the message of Christianity is completely different from that. And we've talked about this a lot in this series, but the message of Christianity, it starts with the premise that we can't do enough. We could never do enough to earn God's favor or to earn right standing before God or to justify ourselves. But God loves us so much that he was willing to send Jesus to, to live the perfect life in our place that we couldn't live and then to pay the price for our sin and our failure through, failure through his death so that because of Jesus, we can have a relationship with God and we can actually be accepted of and, a, and a, we can be approved of and accepted by God because of what Jesus has done, not because of anything we've done. And, the, and just like the Philippians, we need to be warned, we need to be reminded to watch out for this idea of works-based religion because of the fact that it's just in direct opposition to where we can find joy. It's the indirect opposition to a relationship with Jesus. And there's two kind of specific reasons I want to look at kind of under that idea for why we need to watch out for works-based religion. And the first one is just that we need to watch out for works-based religion because it's hard to detect. It's not really a super complex idea. We need to watch out because it's hard to see. But uh, we need to always be on alert because Paul is in this passage, starts it off with, hey, to tell you about this again, that's not a problem for me. He's like, I'll tell you again because it's a protection for you. And then he says to watch out three times in one verse. He says, watch out, watch out, watch out. And repetition in the Bible, that's used for emphasis. So he's saying, hey, really watch out. He's saying we really need to keep our eyes peeled for this because it's not easy to see. And, uh, and Jesus actually um, talked about the exact same idea whenever he was talking to the Pharisees in, uh, in Matthew 23. And if you're not familiar with who the, the Pharisees were, just think of the most you know, moral person you know who's never said a cuss word in their life and is always happy or never gets angry and they stub their toe, they just give you a thumbs up and smile, you know, no swear words ever. Just think of that person multiplied by a thousand and you have an idea of what a Pharisee was like. Because these Pharisees, they had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized and they would follow all the rules and then they would create more rules and follow those rules. And um, if we're, you know, jokes aside, if we met the modern day equivalent of one of these guys, we would really look up to them. Just to kind of give us a picture of how these guys were viewed by the peers, you know, we would really look up to them as very moral, you know, upright people, definitely very pious and religious, but definitely someone who we'd hold in high regard and, and probably, you know, put in a leadership role at a church. But this is what Jesus had to say to them. In, uh, in Matthew 23, this is verses 27 and 28. <clears throat> he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which appear beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones and every impurity. In the same way, on the outside, you seem righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And that's a sobering word from Jesus. And he said that to the Pharisees, the people who look the most religious, the most clean on the outside, which just goes to show us that it's entirely possible to look really nice and really clean on the outside and to be miles and miles away from God and have absolutely no relationship with him whatsoever. So we need to watch out. We need to be alert and be on guard because it's hard to see. And, and we can even begin to uh, deceive ourselves with workspace religion and think that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm good. You know, I haven't done too many bad things and I've done some good things. So I don't know that I really need Jesus. I don't know. I didn't need someone to die for me. And that's such a dangerous place to be when we're unaware, when we're blind to our shortcomings and our need for help. And that's such a dangerous place because the other reason we always need to be on guard and always on the lookout for workspace religion is that it doesn't work. So, uh, so in the late, the late 1800s, uh, Bayer, the uh, German pharmaceutical company, you might know them for their aspirin, they, uh, they rolled out what they were calling a uh, miracle drug or a universal cure-all. They said it was a, a pain reliever that was safe and not addictive or a pain killer that was safe and not addictive. You could use it as a uh, substitute for morphine. They also said that it was an effective treatment for respiratory disease. And uh, the Bayer employees, even when they tested it, they said it made them feel so good, it made them feel heroic. Which is, uh, which is actually how this drug got its name, because this miracle drug was heroin. Yeah, and it had, it had short-term kind of fast-acting uh, you know, benefits against things like tuberculosis and pneumonia because it slowed down breathing, but pretty quickly, uh, doctors began to realize the, the dangerous and even fatal side effects of heroin, and they started to say, hey, this doesn't actually work. Uh, this is poison. And it still took a while. I thought it was really interesting. It took a while for them to pull it off the shelves. One doctor was even quoted as saying, he said, I, I feel as though bringing any charges against heroin is like questioning the fidelity of a good friend. And, you know, today we can look back and we can say, 
Like, man, that's crazy. That's ridiculous that they saw heroin as a solution as, as, as opposed to the problem that it is. And in the exact same way, each and every one of us, so many of us today, will look to our own good works, or our own performance, our own ability to follow rules, we'll look to that as a solution as opposed to the problem that it is. Because it'll make us feel good about ourselves. It'll make us feel like we're making progress. It'll give us this false sense of security or of healing, just like, just like heroin would. But instead of, instead of actually helping us, it's a poison that just leads us to destruction. Because the bottom line is, you know, we can't justify ourselves. We can't save ourselves. The guy, Paul, who wrote this, uh, this letter, Philippians, he wrote another letter uh, to the Christians who were in Rome at the time. And uh, we call that Romans. And in that letter, just very succinctly, very clearly, he said, no one will be justified before God by their works. That's zero people will be justified before God by their works because we need help. Because when Jesus was asked, he was asked, what's the more, most important command? Which that's a really good question. You know, if, if you were hanging out with Jesus to be like, yeah, what's the most important command? And he said it was to love God with your heart, soul, and mind. And the second, which is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So if we can get honest today, you don't have to answer out loud, but how are you doing with those two things? Because personally, I don't always love God perfectly with my entire being, with my whole heart, soul, and mind. And I definitely don't always love other people like I love myself, because I can be selfish. And if you think that you're not selfish, just get married or have a kid, and you will very quickly have the blinders pulled off and realize how selfish you really are. (laughs) But we need help. We need help because we just can't do it on our own. And and, um, those are the most important commands, Jesus said, and we just, we can't. We can't follow those. But I think, I think we understand this. I think we get this when we get honest. We're aware that we're just not perfect. We're aware that we need help. And that's why self-help is such a booming industry. But the issue is we can't help ourselves. And in the same way that you know, Bayer employees felt heroic whenever they were testing heroin, we can start to feel like the hero or like self-salvation is a, it's a thing that we can do. And we'll pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that we can't be the hero. We need a hero. We need Jesus. And no one knew that better than Paul. The reason he can use such harsh language when speaking against those who would try to teach someone to rely on religion is because he used to be one of them. He was a big-time religious guy. He was like the up-and-coming Pharisee, like the all-star. They would have had him pegged as like the, the next best Pharisee coming up. But whenever he met Jesus, Paul, he, Jesus did not say to Paul, he didn't say, hey, Paul, you're, you're almost there. Just do a few more things. He didn't say, you've almost earned my favor. You're getting close. No, what Jesus said, he said, why are you persecuting me? So in an instant, Paul and all his religion realized he had, not gotten, he had not gotten one inch closer to God, but in fact was actually in direct opposition to God and was an enemy of God. So Paul knew better than anyone that we need to watch out for works-based religion because it's hard to detect and because it doesn't work. And he knew after meeting Jesus that joy is found in relationship, not in religion. So after telling us what to watch out for in order to be able to rejoice, in order to be able to have joy, he tells us then in verse 3 what to hold on to or what to remember. I'm just going to re- reread verse 3 for us here. <clears throat> he says, For we are the circumcision, the ones who serve by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. So uh, this actually leads us right up to our, our second main idea today, and that's that joy comes from knowing who Jesus makes us. So we see Paul here reminding Christians, reminding these Christians who they are because of Jesus, who Jesus has made them, or what the identity is of someone who's put their trust in Jesus. And he says a couple things. He says, we are the circumcision, which I'll explain in a second, because that could be really confusing. He said, we serve by the Spirit of God. He said, we boast in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. And I just kind of want to look at each of those things to kind of get an idea. Who is Paul saying we actually are? What is this identity he's telling us that we have? If you've put your trust in Jesus, he's saying first that we're the, cir- the circumcision. And again, that can be confusing in our context. But, but in short, what that means is that anyone who's put their trust in Jesus is a part of God's family. Because circumcision was the sign that God gave to the people of Israel way back in Genesis 17 as the sign of his covenant with them, that they were his people and that he was their God. So what Paul is saying now is regardless of what traditions or rituals you have or haven't followed or had done, regardless of your, you know, family of origin, where you were born or what your background is, he's saying anyone who's put their trust in Jesus is part of God's family. And nothing can change that. Nothing can take you out of God's family once you put your trust in Jesus. Because we didn't earn our way in, so we can't earn our way out. Jesus is going to hold us in that family. 
So we can rejoice in that, and we can rejoice regardless of what circumstances we face because we know we're a part of God's family, and nothing will change it. Next, he said, we serve by the Spirit of God. That means that anyone who's put their trust in Jesus, anyone who's a Christian, has the Holy Spirit in them, which is such an easy thing to take for granted or forget because it's kind of hard to understand. But the fact of the matter is that we have God with us. God's presence is with us at all times. We don't have to go to some special building or some special you know, pilgrimage to a city somewhere to be able to be in God's presence, but that if you're a Christian, he's always with you. And the ability or the strength to serve God or worship God or, or to rejoice regardless of what's happening in life, the ability to do that, it doesn't come from us. We don't have to muster up this strength in ourselves. It comes from God in us, working through us so that we can serve and we can worship God and we can rejoice regardless. So that's good news. And the next thing he says, the next two kind of go together. He says, we boast in Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh. And what he's pointing out here is that our hope or our confidence, our identity, if you've put your trust in Jesus, it's rooted in Jesus alone. It's not in anything you've done. And this is so important for us to remember because uh, I, I read a quote that kind of spoke to that a couple weeks ago from an author, it's a short quote. He said, identity amnesia always leads to identity replacement. When you forget your identity in Christ, you search for identity in people, places, and things. And I think that's such an important thing to remember because regardless of, of where you're coming from, regardless if you, you know, if you would call yourself a Christian or not, we've all put our boast or we all, we've all put our identity or our confidence in something. Whether that's, you know, our work or our own morality or a romantic relationship, our confidence is in something. But if you're a follower of Jesus, your confidence lies in Jesus. Your identity lies in Jesus. And when we forget that, we go right back to our default mode, our default setting of looking for it everywhere else, of looking for it in work or in career success or, you know, or maybe even in our own religious maturity as opposed to looking for it in Jesus, which is the only place that it can really, like these, these other foundations, these other things that we can, we can chase after, the danger in those is that none of those will hold up. Nothing outside of Jesus will hold up when we face the circumstances that this life will throw our way. But a person, whenever, whenever our hope and our confidence, our identity is in Jesus, nothing can shake that. Nothing can move that. When the storm comes, our foundation will stand firm because it's Jesus who's there. It's not, it's not our own thing or something else that just won't last. It's Jesus who's our foundation. And another takeaway from this idea that our boast is in Jesus and not in anything we've done, not in confidence in the flesh, is that there should be no such thing as an arrogant Christian. There should be no such thing as a person who, once they're saved by Jesus, then holds that over other peeper, people. Like, you know, if you were as smart as me, you would get it. Because he's saying, no, 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 your boast is in Jesus. It's not in anything you've done. So a Christian should be someone who realizes that every good thing that, that they have, whether, you know, anything, regardless of what it is, but especially even the relationship we have with Jesus, that good thing, it's a gift. So instead of being arrogant or prideful towards others, we should instead be humbled and in awe at the fact that God would extend grace to us. And in turn, we should turn around and extend that grace to the other people that we interact with in life. So Paul reminds these Christians, he reminds us today, he says, you can have joy because you're part of God's family. God is always with you. And your hope, your confidence is in Jesus. It's not in, it's not in yourself. It's not anything you've done. Because Paul knew that joy, being able to rejoice regardless of circumstance, joy comes from knowing who Jesus makes us. I'm actually going to call up the, the worship team and the response team. We're going we're gonna to wind down here today. And if you want to talk to anybody, that's why the response team's up here. They, they would love to talk with you or pray with you um, during the last song or after the service. But uh, just to close down, you know, if, if you want to have joy, I would just beg you to please, please, please do not believe the lie of works-based religion because it will never bring you joy. It will never earn you favor with God and it will only leave you disappointed and lead you right to destruction. And instead, look to Jesus. And if you already have a relationship with Jesus, remember who you are because of him. Remember that you're part of God's family and that God's always with you. And that your hope is in Jesus, not in what you can do. So Jesus is the one who holds the relationship together. That's not on you. So you can rejoice in that. We can rejoice regardless of what we go through because of that. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, my hope for you is that you would find true joy, that you would find a relationship with Jesus, and you would find the joy that's in that, that's only in that. Because maybe you're here today and you feel like, hey, I am, I am pretty good. I think I'm a pretty good person. I haven't done anything real bad. And, you know, I've heard God's forgiving. So anywhere I've slipped up, he's going to cover that, right? 
And the thing is, God is forgiving. But that forgiveness is only available to us through Jesus, through what he did on the cross, because God is also just. That was the whole purpose of Jesus going to the cross. It was to take the guilty verdict that you and I deserve so that we can be seen as innocent and we can have a relationship with God. So in Jesus going to the cross, we see, yes, you do need a Savior. We all need a Savior. But God loves you enough, Jesus loves you enough to be that Savior for you. Or maybe you're on the other end of the coin. Maybe you don't feel good at all. Maybe you feel, maybe you're starting to believe the lie that you don't have any worth and you feel like you're too far gone. And you feel like no one could love you, much less, much less that God could love you. But I just want you to know today, I want you to hear that Jesus went to the cross for you too. Which shows that the creator of the universe loves you and values you more than you could even imagine. And in Jesus going to the cross, we can see that yes, you are loved. And yes, your life does have value. Because Jesus thought it was worth it to lay down his life to save yours. So please, watch out for religion. Watch out for religious works-based religion. And instead, look to Jesus, where true joy and true hope is found. Thank you.